And good afternoon, 8-Bit Retro Commanders. <laughs> How are we all doing? Yay, it's good to be back. It's good to be back for some Retro ZX Spectrum streaming. <laughs> um, I, I don't really look forward to this stream. It's one of the highlights of my week. I, <laughs> I know we're going to be reminiscing about cool stuff from back in the day. And we're going to be, I don't know, just sort of asking about it in space, really, which is, which is good fun. <laughs> <laughs> and reminiscing on things that were and things that will be. For, so for those of you who are new, um, or those of you who don't know what um, an 8-bit computer is, this is a this is a ancient thing from the 80s that we do on Saturdays, is play through a, a version of a game that is, is, is absolutely historic now. <laughs> but we're still finding new things out about it, so that's good. But there we go. Anyway, so who's on the chat? We've got Alien. Hello, Alien. Thank you very much for popping along. Commander Ariok is here. Um, good. I may need your sage counsel on my quest. So, Commander JR, 1988. Um, good year, 1988. That's the year I left school. <laughs> um, DS Quibi, DJ, uh, DJ S Quibi, sorry. Um, hi all. Um, Panzertard, Chark123, Adamski, in a in a in a in a in a very weird way of spelling. Uh, and G11 is here as well. Fantastic. Lovely to see all you guys on the chat. So if you are, you are new in the chat, do say hello. It's a very friendly stream. We have lots of fun. So it's all kind of good. So now some of you may have noticed. Look, look, look what I found. Look what I found. Because some of you may have been um, following me on um, on uh, on Twitter and know that I have been. Um, oh, and Zen Zenthon O2 is here. Uh, I've been uh, Zenthon O2 is here as well. So welcome there. That's awesome. O7, as we say now <laughs> in Elite Dangerous. It's an official Elite badge. Look at me. I'm rocking an, an original Elite badge. How about that? Now, this is this is the this is now the attire for this stream. I found it. <laughs> Um, so, um, unlike the other one, this is this is my Elite Dangerous one. Okay, so this is the Elite Dangerous one. Uh, I now have the the, the original Elite badge, uh, which is the one that came with the eight bit versions of the game. Long, long, long ago, I found it because I've been tidying up. Um, I've got a new study. I can actually show you. Look, uh, if I if I pull the green screen back, a bit. so look over here. I've got I've got my new study. This is all sort of set up. And it's it's full of eight bit nostalgia. You can see the spectrum actually over there on the screen. So it's uh, it's really good. So um, <laughs> and it's it's all set up for um, for doing stuff. So it's, yes, very very good. But I'm very pleased. And in that process, I found my badge, which I've been looking for for weeks to sort of bring it onto the stream. So now we, now I feel we have um, now I feel we have the magic power. Okay, we have the original badge, and. Um, <laughs> The fabric of reality is about back intact, as you can see. So that's all quite good. It's funny what you can do with the green screen, isn't it? I mean, this green screen is a little bit Heath Robinson, but it works fine. And I can just sort of sit here and I've got the, you know any background I like. It's very, very good. So there we go. So I have I have my original 80s badge. And um, Frontier, obviously, uh, Paige Harvey actually gave me this. So thank you very much to Paige. I don't know if she watches the stream, but um, Paige Harvey from who was, well, she's not Frontier anymore. She, she left, but she gave me uh, actually three of those. So I've got a few spares. So that's my sort of modern version of that badge, which is for my Thursday stream now. So now I've got, I feel like I've got the proper attire. <laughs> so it's all good. It's all good. Um, so yeah, so. Um, and Alien's got an unofficial Elite badge. Ah, oh, I don't know what an unofficial one looks like. Um, so there we go. Uh, right, so anyway, let's get to a quick load. Where am I? Um, right, yeah, I'm trying to remember what we were doing. <laughs> because we're trying to get the fourth mission. Okay, so yes, recap. Um, full screen focus. Uh, not that one, that one. Uh, not that one, that one, that one, that one. There we go. <laughs> have I got multiple hats? Well, I could, but this hat is particularly comfortable. This is a felt fedora, okay? Most, of, and it's not really, to be honest, it's not an, it's not an, out, it, it, I know it sounds a bit weird, but it's not really a good outside hat because you can't wear it in the rain. Um, it's um, quite soft and quite pliable. It's, it's, and it takes off in the, in the wind. <laughs> so in terms of hats and protecting you from the environment, it's not a good hat. It's a. I bought it because I thought oh, that's that's really nice. It's nice and nice and soft and nice on the top of the head. But it's it's not actually a hat that's very practical outside. So it's sort of relegated to streaming duties now. It's my it's my writer's hat. So um, because um, I mean and and yeah, there's a bit of a quandary here, of course, because as a gentleman, you know, of the old school, you're not actually supposed to wear a hat indoors. Um, you know, you're supposed to take it off as you come in. So this is a this is a this is a bit of a Schrodinger's hat, really, because. <laughs> 
it's not who use outdoors and strictly speaking I shouldn't be wearing it indoors but it's sort of become part of the uniform a, it's a, it's it's my little different. I mean, every every streamer has their little differentiator, right? You know, they have their little thing that they do. Okay, um, you know, um, um, Obsidian Ant has um, well, hi guys and girls. You know, <laughs> welcome to thirty three hundred three. That's his little signature thing. Okay, um, mine's the hat. Okay, mine. I don't have a, I don't have a catchphrase. Mine's just the hat. So the hat is a writing thing. Uh, it's a signing books thing. It's a visit conventions thing. It's a streaming thing. So, you know, when you meet me in public, um, you know, if you go along to an elite convention or anything like that, you'll probably, um, you know, <laughs> I'll probably be wearing a hat. It's nice and easily recognisable, OK? Um, and uh, but it's not it's, this this particular hat is not a hat that's going to use outside. <laughs> it can't go with any rain. Um, it just goes straight in. Uh, and I'm not indoors, no, I'm online. That's a very good point, Kelly Bagglass. So there we go. So, um, and Eric Viking is here, Kelly Bagglass here, Kelvinator's here, um, and everybody else is here. This is this is fantastic. So it's, it's got, yeah, so the hat, that's very true, actually, JR. So, yes, yeah, so the hat is to me as the space loach was to Sandro. So, yeah, the hat, that is my, I'm, I'm a space pirate. <laughs> Um, and I'm, uh, like I say, for those of you who just turned up, I've got my, look, 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 I've got my original Elite badge. I found it. I found it. So I'm rather chuffed with myself, um, having found my original Elite badge. Um, so, yeah, I've, you know, we're back to the 80s. We've, we've got everything we need. We have the Spectrum, we have the badge, we, yeah, we're here. We've got the memories. We're good. <laughs> uh, Wintermute, hello. Good to see you as well. Right, so where were we now? We, I was... Um, I've done a, a, a little bit of confession. I have played the game a little bit since the last time we were here. Um, and it's not, it's not bigger. Um, so I've moved a little bit across to try and get a few more jumps in because basically what we need to do to trigger the last mission is more jumps. We just need as many jumps as possible. Um, so I need to up that jump count. So I'm going to do a little bit of that slightly exploitative grind to, you know, to see if we can um, jump that up a little bit for now. Um, and then see if we can trigger that mission. So for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, but let's just very, very quickly recap. We've discovered the Spectrum version has at least four missions in it. We think there's four. The first one was the Supernova, where we had to rescue people from the exploding star. Very cool. Second one was kind of not really a mission, but it was one of those things that just happens in the game, which was pirates have bothered your ship, came over. Um, so we, we got that one. The third one was the ASP with the cloaking device, which is very cool, because we now have a cloaking device on the ship. Um, and so we killed an uh, uh, asp that had this cloaking device and then we picked up its cargo and that gave us the cloaking device. So we now have that. And now there's one more piece of equipment that you get in the next mission, which is an ECM jammer, um, which presumably stops the Thargoids from being able to stop your missiles. I, I don't know because I haven't actually played this mission. Um, so I have done a few jumps in the week just to jump up the jump count. So we've got a better chance today of seeing this mission, but we, there's no guarantees, unfortunately. We'll have to wait and see how it goes, but I have done a few more jumps. Um, so, but the mission hasn't triggered yet. Um, and we believe it's jump related. Commander Ariok has done quite a bit of research into this to find out what the mission trigger is. And it seems to be number of jumps. So we just need to keep jumping. <laughs> That's going to be my sort of thing for the time being, and see if we can get that mission to trigger. Because that's what we want to see. And if we if we do that, we pretty much play the um, uh, we pretty much play the yeah. No, I need to update that uh, graphic, don't I? There's no fedora. I, well, there is a fedora graphic in there somewhere, um, but I haven't got one with me on, the, on top of my head. I, I'll have to work on that. That's a that's a good suggestion. I I will do that. <laughs> Thank you, Panzer Todd. That's a good idea. Uh, so, um, and Commander Ariok did something that I rather thought was rather good. He got to elite um, in number of kills, and then went round the all the galactic charts back to galactic chart one, and um, and, and then got back to Lave as elite with all the equipment. And that was he's kind of finished the game. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll do that to finish off. Um, so yeah, Mint with an ECM jammer is sort of an ECMCM. <laughs> That's a really good way of describing it. Uh, but I haven't got that yet, so my equipment list looks like this. So I've got the large cargo bay, the fuel scoops, ECM system, energy bomb, energy docking computers, um, front military laser, rear mining laser, cloaking device, which is quite cool. And we also have an escape pod on board, which for some reason doesn't show up on the equipment list. I don't know why. As you can see, I've been doing a bit of trading as well. I've got a little bit more cash. Not much, to be fair. And then I started doing the jumping around again. So I found these two systems, which are not too far apart, um, where we can do some jumping. So we're going to do that for a bit and see 
if we can get this mission to trigger. So as you can see, we've got this natty pink display today because we have a, that's our escape pod. Um, so let's see what the game does with us. No, that's right, so there's, there's no fedora, there's no true. <laughs> I, shall, I shall provide some extra graphics for that. I need to do that. Right, so literally, I'm just going to be jumping back and forth. Now, I don't know, again, um, Commander Ariok may be able to tell me what the mission trigger to the Thargoid invasion thing is um, and what actually, actually happens as a result. Um, because in the supernova mission, we got some text that okay, told us something was happening. With the ASP mission, we didn't get any warning, it just happened to us. Um, so I don't know how the Thargoid one um, transpires, but um, we're going to find out. Um, morning, Commander Sea Dweller, thank you. Morning, what, where are you? <laughs> it's not morning here. <laughs> Um, it's either very, maybe you're, are you West Coast um, states or something? Because it's quite early for, um, uh, sorry, East Coast states. It's probably quite early for West Coast states. Um, and because um, you're about four hours away, four or five hours away, I think the East Coast of the states time zone, so that would be about eight o'clock in the morning for you. If you're West Coast, then it's about five o'clock in the morning, which seems a little bit keen. Um, Oh, it should be when I next dock. Okay, so I haven't docked recently. Okay, well, let's, let's do a few jumps. Ah, okay, so when you, uh, when you go to dock. Ah, okay, well, that's that's worth knowing. Okay, so I may have already triggered it because I think I need fuel scooping mostly to do this, to, to up this jump count. Commander JR1988 says, actually, I started playing a leak the other day and gave Lords of Midnight a go, both on mobile and on the try. I actually managed to jump out to the Well done. How did you find Lords of Midnight? Lords of Midnight, I think, actually works rather well on mobile. Um, it's actually better than it was on the Spectrum, partly because it's faster, and partly because um, actually the mobile swipe and move around actually seems more intuitive than the original um, Spectrum. Um, Oh no, Commander Sea Dweller was just being dozies in Bedfordshire, which obviously is in a different time zone to Kent. <laughs> right, so we are out of fuel. So let's go to the space station then. Uh, oh, a pirate instantly appears. So let's deal with whoever that is. Um, so uh, this is probably a asp. Always seems to be an S. Oh no, it's a Python. It's funny how, after a while, even in just a few set of pixels, you can instantly recognise what ship it is. Oh, I've overheated my guns. Warning, taking heat damage. Boom. Right, have I got any cargo on board? Let's be a little bit careful here. Um, I don't want to scoop the... I don't want to scoop the escape pod. At the moment, I'm being clean, okay? I'm playing the game properly. Um, <laughs> uh, and I don't want to get myself into trouble by scooping because if I scoop the escape pod they're, they're, they turn into slaves and that gives me an offender tag which I don't really want at the moment um, now I've also confirmed the one thing I was experimenting a little bit the other week was you know you know, occasionally I shoot up these things and they turn out to be anacondas or possibly rock hermits um, I've confirmed that the rock hermit stroke anacondas don't rotate so you can tell the difference um, between them. I'll, if, if one shows up I'll show it to you. Um, so while the, uh, while the, um, the wireframe configuration seems to be identical, um, the, um, they, they don't rotate. So you can tell the difference between the asteroid and, and the other thing. Now I'm still not convinced whether or not what we're looking at is an anaconda or whether it is actually a rock hobbit because um, the, the, uh, there's, there's a discontinuity between the two because the problem is if it's oh, well, there you go the RNG screws me up anyway <laughs> gives me slaves um, that was good unless I accidentally scoop the escape pod there don't think I did well I might as well pick up the other one now because we're going to be a fender anyway um, I'm rescuing him really that's what I'm doing um, no, I've got two tons of slaves. Oh well. So now I become an offender, you see. Yeah. Um, which isn't quite so good, but what can you do? It's a shame you can't rescue escape pods. That would be quite a nice piece piece of gameplay, really. Um, so um, so there we go. Anyway, so 
<laughs> Never mind. To be honest, it was a little bit confusing. Got to read up a little bit. Okay, so yeah. So Lords of Midnight without the manual is a bit um, a bit tricky. Now it does have the, the mobile version does have some in-game help to be fair, but it's not quite the same as having the manual. So it's worth if you. I don't know if there are some scans of the manual for Lords of Midnight online, but there might be. Um, so it does take a little bit. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, and Commander Arrow says, Longmore Mobile is fantastic. Play every year starting on the Winter Souls. Oh, good idea. Mm, that's, a, that's a nice idea. Playing it, at, oh, well, maybe, I'll, maybe we'll do that. That's a good idea for a future stream. When the Winter Solstice hits, when's that? December 21st, isn't it? That's a few, we're six months away from that at the moment. Oh, that chucks three pirates at me right as I get close to the space station. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, I think I might do that. I'm, I'm going to reserve some time then, actually, at the Winter Solstice. Let's have a game of Lords of Midnight on the Spectrum, actually. I think that would be fun, rather than playing the modern version. It's just a quick, quick. They're not being very strong anymore. I can't really handle a military laser. Right, let's pick up some cargo, because why not? Um, oh, more slaves. <laughs> it's obviously slave trading day today. Um, oh, there's another not a pirate appeared. I hope this is a crate, uh, because crates carry cargo. And now we've got three of them on me. Come on. There we go, let's scoop that up. Now the shield's holding, we're good. Food, really boring, never mind. I'm almost in system space actually, so oh that's just a sidewinder, so no cargo, nothing interesting here. Boom. What's this other one? Just wandered. Oh it's that looks like an asp. No? What is that? That must be a cobra. Dispatch them, pick up the cargo, and see if we can head for that space station. Nice, liquor and wines. Okay, we should be able to pick up the space station. Yay, there we go. Um, right, old games, the manual was integral to play. Yeah, it was, right, so we nothing has triggered mission-wise yet. Okay, so let's sell our ill-gotten games. Um, and so we'll go to the space station each time and s just wait for it to trigger I think I think that's all we can really do at this stage is wait for that mission to happen so let's save there I've almost got 10,000 credits um, and we'll just keep jumping about and then we'll, we'll, we'll fight our way back again <laughs> um, at least you can finally rescue escape pods in these dangerous. Yes, that's true, you can. Yeah, no, that's quite good fun. In old games, the manual was integral to play. Nowadays, everyone expects an online tutorial. Yeah, so, I mean, there wasn't space in the old games to put a tutorial, maybe they would have done it. I mean, occasionally you came across a game which had a sort of training level, but um, most of the time, just read the manual. Okay, the manual gave you everything you needed to do to start, and then you had to learn everything else. So, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? But I like game manuals, because you can read them offline. Um, so, I mean, I remember, when my parents, you know, told me to go to bed, you know, when I was a kid, obviously, not now. <laughs> um, that, um, you know, I would take the, you know, because the beautiful thing about Lords of Midnight and Elite, they came with books, okay, and you could study the manuals offline. So I used to play the game and then my, you know, my parents would say, right, you've got to go to bed. Uh, can I read? Well, yes, of course, because reading's good, a computer game is bad, you know. <laughs> Do you remember those conversations? Um, and um, and so I was encouraged to read. So of course, to <laughs> read the game manual <laughs> and go and work out what you were going to try next time you were playing the game. Um, so you know all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, and um, so yeah, but the nice thing is you could then study at your leisure. You weren't under any pressure to play the game at that point. So you could kind of go, okay, well, does it mean that I'm looking for that? You know, if I have six missiles rather than three, you know, and if I do this and do that and I, you know, plan my upgrade for this, maybe I'll go there. All that sort of stuff you could sort of think about offline. So you tended to do that because of the game manual. And the beauty of Lords of Midnight, 
in that bit is that they not only had a manual, but the manual sort of contained the story as well. So you could study that in the clue. I mean, yeah, me and my friends at school were always doing that and comparing notes over this and comparing <laughs> very anal and OCD, but it was yes, yeah, what we did, you know. There was no internet forums to discuss anything like that back in the day. So um we we used to just it was just the school playground. Oh, have you read the so and so and the so and so? You know all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, so you know, so all that sort of stuff was was, was cool. Um, so there we go. Um, so um, ah, and we got to the, now. Um, Real Alex, um, thank you very much for popping along again. Now I, I I have received your email. I haven't had a chance to answer it yet. So um, thank you very much for that. I do need to get on with that um, as a loads of emails I need to catch up with this week. Um, oh, I've got, I've got, I've got problems already. Here come the, here come the bad dudes. Looks like I've got two there. Yep, I have. Um, all right, let's have a bit of cloaking device while we get into range. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you very much for that. Um, oh, both sidewinders. Oh, I like the cloaking device. The cloaking device is so cool. You can't see me, but I can fire when cloaked. <laughs> then I've got two of them. Um, gives you a massive technical advantage in certain situations. Oh, I've, re I've decloaked. Well, now I'm coming for you, Mr. Crate. Which I assume is a crate. Yes. So you're going to just give me a tasty cargo. Boom. Um, right. Scoop it. Oh, look out. Look, yeah, see? Look out. Look out. Look out. Look out. Look out. Calm and collected I am. <laughs> um, so. Um, so yeah, so um, Atari Baby 43, thank you very much for popping along. Um, yes, we are playing the ZX Spectrum version of it, and the reason we're playing it is we are trying to capture all of the missions for on stream. We've managed to capture three out of four so far, and um, we're relatively late game here. As you can see, we are we are dangerous. We've got most of the equipment, and um, we are. But we're, what I'm trying to do is capture the missions. So. Um, the first one was a supernova mission, we caught that. Second one was a Pirates Aboarded Your Spaceship mission, which wasn't really a mission, but um, it was a feature of the game. And the third one was a cloaking device mission for an ASP. And the fourth one, we um, I have it on good authority that it is a Thargoid invasion, um, which I'm quite looking forward to playing. But we're, we're trying to make sure we trigger the mission. We're trying to get the requisites to trigger the mission, uh, but we haven't seen it trigger yet. So that's what we're basically trying to do. Now the mission triggers are to do with your rank, which has to be competent or higher. Uh, we'll pick up the alloys actually, it's worth it. They're, they're not, they actually are surprisingly lucrative alloys. Um, so yeah, so the mission triggers are, um, you've got to be competent, okay, to start with. So that's your first requirement for the spectrum missions um, and it's worth pointing out the spectrum missions are a little bit different to the BBC ones they're not written by the same folks so different missions from the ones that were on the BBC the BBC had two missions as I understand it um, and I believe the BBC missions are um, the constrictor mission where you have a virtually almost invincible ship that you have to bring down um, and the other mission on the um, BBC is Thargoid plans, where you have to take some plans across from one part of the galaxy to another uh, under constant attack by the Thargoids. And that's those are the two missions on the BBC version. Um, I believe, unless somebody else um, uh, can tell me otherwise, um, they were the same on the Commodore 64, except the Commodore 64 had the Trumbulls mission, which again is sort of not really a mission, it's just a feature, but um, the Trumbulls are the C64 edition. So I think um, that's it for the BBC and the C64 version. So the Spectrum version, um, it probably because, I mean, it was, it, you know, we've talked about this, it's a port of Elite, not a, not a, um, a direct transfer. So the missions are different on the Spectrum version. The, the Spectrum version has the Supernova mission where you rescue people from an exploding star. Um, pirates have boarded your ship, which is not really a mission, it's just um, annoying. <laughs> Um, the cloaked asp, which gives us this cloaking device, which is a, which is a I think a spectrum unique feature. Um, you know, so you can cloak your ship, um, and uh, and and cause mayhem that way. And um, the last one we believe for the spectrum is the one we're seeking out at the moment, which is the Thargoid invasion, and apparently it triggers after a certain number of jumps. 
and throws us into a conflict of some kind. So we need to investigate that. We haven't seen that one trigger. But the basic triggers are you must be competent on the ranking scale and you must not be in Galaxy 1. You must have moved out of Galaxy 1. So the, the way the Elite on the Spectrum is structured is that Galaxy 1 is sort of a training galaxy um, and none of the missions trigger until you're out of that. And it has to be said, there was a notable jump in the AI capability as well. When I left Galaxy 1, I noticed that quite dramatically. So the ships got harder um, and there were more pirates um, showing up you know, with the RNG of the game. Once I left Galaxy 1, that was quite noticeable. So Galaxy 1 is definitely a sort of... Oh, I hate it when that happens, I shoot the cargo. <laughs> Uh, so Galaxy 1 is definitely a sort of almost like a training level for Elite in the spectrum. So only the interesting stuff starts happening when you leave Galaxy 1. Um, and of course you have to abort a galactic hyperspace drive to do that, um, which costs a bit of money, so it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a gate. Uh, now I'm just going to close on this because this is one of these... Is this... Now, okay, this is, this is, this is one of these rock hermit stroke anacondas. Notice it looks like an asteroid, but it isn't rotating, okay? So if I shoot that, we'll get into trouble, okay? But it's, and it, it, notice it also changes course? So it's not a rock hermit. This is what's a bit weird about this version, is that it flies, okay? It's now flying away under its own power. Um, and if I shoot that, it will launch two ships at me, a crate and a sidewinder normally, um, to defend it and it will attack me as well so I'm I don't know what that's supposed to be is that a rock hermit in which case the rock hermit's got an asteroid that can fly around on its own power and shoot back or is it an anaconda but with the wrong wireframe model this is this is a question that remains unanswered on the spectrum version um, so I don't know I mean, So I might take another look at that thing in a minute. I'll get rid of this asp. Come on, stop turning. Oh, we're in, a, we're in a circle of doom here. The asp is quite a fast ship, as you can see. It can actually outrun me. If it wants to. But it's not going to survive much longer. There's the escape pod. Boom. All right, let's pick up those alloys. Let's see if I can sneak around. Nice. So I'm going to go back for a moment, just as an aside here, and look at this thing. I'd, 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 like, I'd like the view of the chat, and, and anybody who really knows the Spectrum version well, tell me what you think is going on here, because that is, a, that actually, look there, that spawned um, just in front of us. That is an asteroid, okay, I think. That's, or not. Yeah. The other one is an asteroid as well. This one isn't. Okay, it's actually got two of them now. So that's not an asteroid either. That's not rotating. And if I try flying at it, I'm going to slow down. Watch what happens, okay? It will. It gets out of the way, okay? So it takes evasive maneuvers to avoid a collision. So it is moving under its own steam, as it were. <laughs> um, and I haven't attacked it. So, But it's, it, it's an asteroid wireframe, okay? Um, and if I shoot that, it will launch two ships at me. But, and they will attack me. But that will also attack me as well. It has a laser on it. So what is it? Is it a rock hermit or is it an anaconda? I I don't know. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Commander Sinclair says kill it anyway. Um, well, I'm trying to be good at the moment. I don't want to do, I'll, I'll, well, once, um, oh, we are a fender. We could, we could attack it. Um, let's, let's, let, okay, let's do that. It doesn't look like an anaconda, it's wrong, isn't it? Okay, let me close up on it. We're going to pursue it, okay? Uh, this will make me an offender, but hey, okay. Um, it's for science, okay? Got to investigate this. Okay, so may I think it's a malformed anaconda. Um, does the anac but did the anaconda in the other versions launch ships against you? Um, okay, so th you know, I'm now pursuing it, okay? And it's holding steady on this course. 
and it's like it's flying sideways you know <laughs> so i don't know what it's supposed to be um and the other thing that's a bit weird about this is this ship is fast enough to keep up with me okay so not if it's an if it's an ash if it's a rock hermit it's got some amazing drive unit okay um because it can keep up with me and it's traveling you know if i pace it here it's traveling at the moment at about half my maximum speed okay and it's it's jiggling around a little bit it's sort of warning me off now if i fire on it watch what happens okay it now is going into attack mode okay and it will try and maneuver on me which it can't so let's just blast again it should I'm going to try and stay close to it when it launches. I'm going to just try it. There we go. It's trying to come around. Right, there we go. Okay, so it launched a, it's launched a sidewinder at me. And there's there's the other sidewinder. Now, I can kill those with impunity because they, the computer thinks they're pirates because they fired on me first. Okay? So I can wipe them out. Okay. Right, now. That's, oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a bounty hunter that's just turned up just because, so I'll get rid of him as well. Okay, right, so the original ship, whatever it is, is it the Doomsday Machine out of Star Trek? Right, now it's, it's firing at me, okay? So it, it's a ship of some kind, okay? Right, there we go, it is literally, is there. you can see that, I have evidence on the screen, it is firing at me. Um, okay, and it will, it will evade, Right, now if I try and run away, this is the interesting bit, okay? If I try and run away from it, let's run for the space station. Let's assume, okay? Watch what happens, okay? I'll get it on the rear view. Okay, you can see it on the scanner. Where is it? Okay, it's now attacking me. I can't quite roll it around. Where is it? Okay, so it's shooting at me. My shield, rear shield's down. There it is, okay. Right, now watch, okay? It will move away from me. It's retreating on the scanner at the moment. So it seems I can outrun it, but you'll notice in a moment. Okay, it's just dropped behind the sun there. Okay. My shields, it's still firing on. Now, well, look, it's, there it comes. It's drawing back into range, even though I'm at full speed. Okay. So it's faster than me as well. Um, so what is it? <laughs> Because if it's an anaconda, it's not supposed to be as quick. So I, you know, I don't know what this is supposed to be. Um, it's a, it's an opponent that is so big it can launch two ships at me. Um, I don't know if it's just left in the game as a surprise, um, you know. But it's 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 quite fearsome because a it can launch two ships at me, b it's got its own gun, and it's incredibly fast. If I cloak, it it, it can't hit me. Um, yeah. You know, and look how fast it's moving there. It really is hurtling along. Right, now I've got... So I'm going to have to kill it. It's quite tough as well. There it goes. It's launched an escape pod. Boom. So it launches an escape pod and drops cargo. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a ship. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Liquor and wines always nice. Who's this? Oh, it's a python. So I reckon, I'd love to know the answer to this. It seems like one of the ship wireframes got confused on the Spectrum version uh, and they didn't pick it up during debugging. Um, and maybe the it's supposed to be a rock hermit, which basically means that maybe it's um, not supposed to move around like that. Um, but what you end up with is like a kind of uber ship that is faster than the Cobra Mark III, could carry two other vessels, um, <laughs> and um, has it has its own gun as well. So I'm guessing that uh, that, that seems most likely, doesn't it, that the um, uh, the wireframe was done. Um, so yes, we need to get that original. It's a shame. Um, I have asked. I have found the original developer of the game uh, online, but he hasn't answered me. Um, and I don't really want to pressurise him. So. I might give him one more ping, um, just sort of see if he's up for anything. Because it'd be nice, it'd be nice if he joined us on the stream, and maybe just we could say hello. Kind of thing. Um, 
So that's that's that is a little bit of a mystery on the Spectrum version. It certainly behaves like a ship, um, but um, it's it's not a ship that appears in the manual. <laughs> it's not correctly. Um, so I've always thought of that as an anaconda in my head, um, because it's clearly a ship. But um, I don't know. It does. Um, and yeah, so if it wasn't Anaconda, why is it static when you first encounter? Well, it's just slowly traveling through space. So it's doing what the other non-hostile ships do. It just, it spawns in front of you and then is slowly moving. Um, so I, I don't know. It's, it's definitely an anomaly. Um, so maybe it's, maybe it's an asteroid base. Yeah, that'd be quite good, wouldn't it? <laughs> so we're back to being a fugitive again. So we're gonna have to um, behave ourselves for a bit. Okay, so eight tons of alloys. Is he we are making some money? It's not too bad, is it? Right, buy some fuel again. We still haven't triggered the mission as far as we can tell. Um, let's save. And on we go. But it's traveling sideways. Yeah, I know it's it's a, it's it's weird. Um, um, so the Braben uh, Braben Bell anomaly. Um, so we don't know what it is exactly that one. So that's that's a that is a bit strange. Uh, fascinating how these vintage semi 3D games seem to manage to achieve AI pathfinding, decent game mechanics, and dynamic AI response in the 3D environment. I know I, this is something that gets me a little bit, and I know there's a bit of rose tinted glasses about this, and I appreciate that. Um, and you know the the, you know, the graphics are primitive, and the capability of the machine is primitive, and you see more into these games because of the, what they're missing almost. Um, but even with that, you know, the fact that we've got a cloaking device and we've got missiles and we've got lasers and we've got different levels of difficulty and stuff, so there is a genius in these early games, um, which I find modern games sometimes struggle to emulate. Um, I don't know. I don't know what, whether or not I'm just, it's very difficult to me, for me, as, 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 as you know, a nearly 50 year old man. <laughs> Um, to be objective about this game, uh, because I played it to utter death as a teenager. This game, this is this is one of my top games ever, uh, which you won't be surprised to know. Um, and um, but I still, it's still eminently playable today. I think it's it's got something that makes it. Oh, just one more jump, one more trigger mission, <laughs> one more pirate attack. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all those sort of things. It, it's got a verisimilitude, I think that's the right word, which just makes it very compelling to play. It just feels like, I don't know. And I think, yeah, there's a good point Kelly Baglar makes actually, which is um, that, you know, it's a single player game, therefore you are the center of the universe. And in fact, the way the game is written is you literally are the center of the universe. As you're flying around, the entire universe is effectively rotating around you and you're static. <laughs> this is the way the game's coded. But even given all that, um, it's remarkably well thought through. Um, and um, actually, yeah, and in these versions, I mean, because there was no internet, no way to patch the game, um, you know, it's remarkably bug free. There are a few bugs um, and ex exploits that are available if you are being unscrupulous, but not very many. Um, so, you know, those sort of things, um, you know, are interesting, but it's, you know, it still works. <laughs> it still works. It's well balanced. It is very well balanced. I mean, it's still possible, even for me, I mean, I've got pretty much everything on the ship, okay? I've got the cloaking device, I've got missiles, I've got lasers, I've got super shields, energy bomb, energy unit, anti-missile system, etc., etc., etc. It's still possible for the game to kill me quite easily, okay? It's still possible, you know, if it chucks four pirates at me, which it can do, uh, four, uh, five or six actually is a, a maximum it will chuck at me in one go, but then it can spawn a second set. And if it does that and you're tactically unlucky, um, you will die. There's nothing you can do about it. You just don't have the energy to counter that many ships. Um, so the game can still kill you and you have a choice to engage, disengage, um, trigger your weapons, trigger your uber weapons, all those sort of things. Um, 
So you have the choice of engaging or disengaging. So you've got the option to take the risk and sometimes it pays off and obviously sometimes it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I, I still think it's very, very good, even now. Um, I can play it as a game quite happily knowing its limitations and I'm, I'm still enjoying flying around in my ship you know it's I don't know is that is that nostalgia is it because it's a really good game is it a combination of both I'm not sure but um, I still think it's a remarkable achievement um, and it, it, it invites you to imagine more stuff that's going on you know, you know where's that cobra going you know I know it's just a piece of RNG that it's happened to spawn there and it's all it's going to do is fly away but the fact that if I fly towards it it evades um, and then you know if I shoot it it will switch to attack and you know and it spawns an escape pod and all that sort of stuff um, <laughs> it's a case of Stockholm syndrome yeah it could be <laughs> um, all that stuff I think is still quite competitive you know where's that cobra going yeah, I, I want to know he's off where is he? Where is he going? I mean, I know there's nothing behind that, but the game makes you think there is, and that's 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 the magic of this game. Is it? It's more than the sum of its parts, um, and maybe being over imaginative teenager helps. Yeah, it's probably right. Yeah, I think that's that's probably true as well. Um, but very very cool, very cool and compelling. And I think that's one of the things that we've maybe lost a little bit over time because computer games of this era. You know, they could only be so big and they could only be so deep because of the physical limitations of that. We have 48,000 bytes of storage space on this computer. Um, and only about 30K of that is actually accessible to us to put a program in. So whatever you did, whatever your game was, had to fit within those constraints. There was no way to expand that at, at this point in time. Um, so, you know, the limitations were there. You, know, you have to put your entire game in 30,000 bytes of computer code. That's it, that's all you got, okay? There's nothing you can do about that. So that comes down to how good a programmer you are and how clever you were at leading the player on to whatever the next thing was in the game. Um, and that's what these guys did so well, okay? Working with the limitations of the machines to provide you. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're in a spaceship in a, procedurally generated universe of hundreds and hundreds of different star systems, which are all superficially exactly the same, but it makes you think you're on a journey, okay? So every single planet that's here in these systems um, is superficially identical, but because of the clever way that the game works, um, some of them feel like safe places and some of them feel like really dangerous places. And you get the choices of where you want to go and you can take choice. You can make those risk-based decisions in your gameplay. Um, and that's something that actually even Elite Dangerous doesn't have so well. If you go to an anarchy system in Elite, you need to make sure you've got a really, really heavy ship because the chances are if you don't, you will not survive the trek to the space station. You just won't survive because the game will chuck pirate after pirate after you. If you go into a corporate state in Elite, you're almost guaranteed to get there straight away and the only ships that you're going to see are passing freight, which are all safe. Unless you're a fugitive, in which case the bounty hunters are after you. Now, if you play Elite Dangerous and go to an anarchy system, the chances are nothing's going to happen to you when you get to the space station and the same with the safe system the the the, the danger isn't in the quite the same sort of way is you know so yeah, there are things you can learn from these older games in terms of actual kind of well i don't want to go there because i know i will die you know <laughs> at this point in the game all those sort of things um, um but you know there are limitations you have one star one planet one sun you know, in every single system. It, the only variety really is the description, and that is procedurally generated. But even that, you know, um, it's a dictatorship of large green slimy lizards. <laughs> it does make the it does make your head your head your head spin a little bit and go, oh, what about this? What about that? Right now, somebody suggested um, that we um, um, we do another galactic jump to maybe help the mission tree. That may be required. I don't know. It might be worth doing anyway. Um, so I think we might do that. Let's go somewhere else because why not? Um, that's what I miss from some of the modern games, the invitation to use your imagination. So, I mean, there was no choice back in this day and age. You know, back in the 80s, you had to use your imagination to enjoy the game. Um, but it was possible to imagine. Now, what they've done with, let's say, Elite Dangerous in this case is that they've taken what most of us thought was going on in our heads with Elite and turned it into Elite Dangerous. And it looks really, really, really good. But something intangible has been lost in that process. Because the graphics are so amazing today, 
your ability to imagine what's going on is constricted almost because you can see it. Um, um, oh, not recommended, says Commander Ariok. Your jump count will reset. Okay, so let's not do that. I'm glad, I'm glad you typed that in. <laughs> okay, so we don't want to do that. We're just gonna we're just gonna stick with our original plan. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so th let's not do that. Um, um, and as a programmer, one can appreciate how much they crammed into the meager memory of the Spectrum. Yeah, so there isn't a great deal of memory. In fact, the Spectrum was, in some ways, better endowed than many of the other computers. As whilst the Commodore sixty four technically had 64k of RAM, I think, I don't know enough about this, uh, I don't think it had much of it as, as accessible, the Spectrum had, you know, 30 something k actually accessible, 32k I think actually accessible out of the 48, um, and um, I know the BBC was only a 32k entirety, so it only had about 22k available as I recall, so stuff like that, you know, the, there were there were real limitations, okay. Um, and icons take more space, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, and the address space of the Spectrum was 64, and then there was obviously a later 128K version, but um, that, that's going on a little bit, changing things around. Um, right, so anything mysterious in the original Elite interests me. I had the BBC cassette version, so I didn't see any of the intriguing stuff. So yeah, so the, um, the Spectrum version sits um, kind of a little bit between the Elite BBC disc version and the tape version because you haven't got all the ships in the Spectrum version, but you do have some missions which are quite cool. Um, there we go. Okay, so there's um, there's various bits. I remember that yeah yeah so 16k ROM and 48k RAM. That's right, and then you lose nine for the screen memory, which is part of the the, system, the, the RAM memory. I do remember that. Um, <laughs> it's all coming back to me. The address space of the Spectrum. That's right. So let's keep jumping around. Let's see if we can get this mission to trigger today. Um, uh, Quantum NG have one of those too. Yeah, so it's it's all good stuff. Um, DJ Ambrosia says, Deve I've developed on 76 text with modern systems. Programmers these days have no idea how tough it could be with such base limitations. Yeah, so you were, uh, I remember there's an interview online with David Braben and Ian Bell about Elite. And they were you know, going through their original code for the BBC on the 6502 looking to save bytes here and there so they could add in extra features into the game and you know they were pouring over the code and if they found a way to save a couple of bytes you know in a day's work then that was a that was a day well spent <laughs> you're kind of thinking that day that's just um unbelievable you know you just add a bit more ram and a bit more disk space onto your computer job done you couldn't do that on these 8-bit computers they were fixed what you had was what you had there was no way to expand them um Beyond a certain limitations, so you know the eight-bit um, computers really practically had um, a sixty-four k you know, kilobyte limitation because that's the amount of memory that they could address, and that was that was all they could do. Now they employed some clever tricks with what they called page bank memory to allow you to have one hundred and twenty-eight k, but it was not compatible with the earlier machines. Um, so really, you were you were stuck with just a few k bytes of memory, and the, the hardware that covered it. So your game had to exist within those confines and do everything that it needed to do first time, because there was no way for you to patch it easily after the event, because all the software came on cassette. <laughs> you had to load it in. Um, so um, yeah, so that's what you're dealing with on these things. It's very, very, very limited stuff, and. Um, that's 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 it. So you know, kudos to these programmers. They were geniuses, really. Um, and if you look at some of the games available for the BBC and the Commodore sixty four and the Spectrum, they're very um, innovative um, for their time. And it's very interesting to chart how they changed over time as well. Um, if you look at the games that came out in sort of nineteen eighty one and nineteen eighty two. They're all coin-op conversions, okay? So everybody was basically ripping off the arcades. <laughs> um, and you'll see all the games are, um, you know, kind of ready player one type of things. 
Um, and you know, you have three lives, and then you're dead, and then you press space to have another go, kind of thing. Um, and virtually everything was in that format, so you would see. I mean, on the spectrum, we had loads of unofficial things like space intruders, <laughs> which is obviously space invaders, uh, but just ripped off. So, uh, you yeah, know, the copyright was very, <laughs> very lax in those days, and we had. Um, uh, we had Planetoid, which was a scramble clone. We had, um, there was one quite good Defender clone, which I can't remember the name of. Um, and um, basically every arcade game that was out, you know, the relatively simple like Galaxians and Space Invaders and Defender and Pac-Man all had clones on these home computers pretty early on. Okay, so the BBC had them, the, the, the Spectrum had them, and the Commodore 64 had them. Um, and um, that's how it all sort of started. And then, of course, what developers began to realise is, hang on a minute, none of these home computers actually need the insert coin mechanism. Okay, so why why are we writing games that require the same dynamic, i.e. that you, you, you play it through for a little bit of time, you have three lives and then the game resets, okay? And the idea is only really to beat the high score the previous time you played. Uh, so that's, then they started thinking, that's when Elite first came out. These sort of, you know, this paradigm was changing. Um, Planetoids, was it? Okay. Um, uh, there we go. So um, so that, you know, then they suddenly said, well, hang on, these home computers don't need an insert coin mechanism. Why are we still writing games with three lives? So David Brave and Ian Bell came up with Leap, which is a game that you can play for much, much longer. There aren't any lives in it. You know, you you have a, a life really, and you're, there's no score either. You know, there's only there's only reputation and cash, which is all very 80s. Um, and um, they took it along to publishers, and the publishers said, well, this, this, what, what are you doing? This isn't how you write a computer game. Yeah, where are the three lives? Uh, and they sort of tried to explain that's not how the game worked. And the initial publisher they, they took it to basically said, no, no, take it away, turn it into a space shooter, put three lives in it and put a high score, then we'll publish it. And, you know, they, to be, you know, kudos to David Braben and Ian Bell, they, they didn't, they didn't. They went to another publisher who basically explained that this game doesn't work in a coin-op way. That's not what it's about. Um, and then hence Elite was ultimately born. And then... Um, you know, one of the things that was particularly unique about the Spectrum, and if you look, um, and you can you can argue, is the Spectrum um, the best gaming computer of its era? Um, from a hardware perspective, absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. Um, but there's one thing that the Spectrum had, uh, which nobody anticipated. Okay, so if you look at it from a hardware level, right? You look at it from a hardware level. Um, the Spectrum is um, has has a reasonably high resolution display, but it has significant color limitations, which um, you know, and the attribute color clash that we've talked about. Okay, um, but um, it didn't have a sprite generator uh, like the Commodore sixty four, and it didn't have any decent sound capabilities like the BBC and, and the various different graphics modes that the BBC had. What um, what you had on the Spectrum, what you saw was what you got. Okay, you got one graphics mode, really primitive sounds, no hardware support for gaming at all. Okay, it was not designed to be a gaming machine. It had no sprite generator or anything like that that would give it a, an advantage. All it did have was basically everything in the computer was accessible from what is effectively the command line. Okay, everything. You didn't have to go into any special modes. It, you could do anything from anywhere, um, and it was. You know, it was a simple-ish um, system, so no no hardware complexity in it. Elegantly simple, um, and because it didn't have any hardware to support games, people could write anything for it, and it the, those games lived or died on how good a game they were. Um, so whereas on the sixty-four, you tended to get games that would take advantage of the sprite hardware which meant mostly 2D platformy shooty types of games um, because that's what the Sprite hardware was really good at. On the Spectrum, there was no advantage to doing that or not. So if you wanted Sprites, you had to software program them um, and do all that work first before you could even start. Whereas on the C64, you had the Sprite mechanism in the, in the hardware, so you didn't have to worry about it. 
Um, and that made people who program for the Spectrum do all sorts of weird and wacky stuff, okay? Um, and most of the isometric games came out first on the Spectrum. A lot of the vector graphics games, not Elite, but a lot of the vector graphics games came out on the Spectrum early because the Spectrum had the advantage of just raw processing power in many ways. So it actually made the games more interesting in some ways and produced more innovation because the hardware was really rubbish. <laughs> Which I know sounds a bit weird, but there we go. Um, that's, just, that's just sort of how it turned out. And I think I'm right in saying that the number of games written for the Spectrum compared to the Commodore 64 and the BBC, for example, way, way bigger. Way, way bigger software library ultimately for the Spectrum. So, um, yeah, that's the thing. Right, so still no mission. Uh, right, I better catch up with the chat. There we go. It's a planetoid in a single. Okay, there we go. Uh, um, we. Okay, so what are we talking about? <laughs> well, I've been wishing away. You've been talking about something else. What's the best? Ve what's the best version of Elite? Says Chromo Sundrift. Um, it depends who you ask. Um, the consensus is the Archimedes version. I would. Pr I haven't actually played the Archimedes version, so I can't really comment on the first hand. However, it is. It is supposed to be a really good version of Elite. Um, now it depends how purist you want to go. If, if <laughs> because the Archimedes and the Amiga and the Com and the um, Atari ST are sixteen-bit computers, so arguably they're not the native platforms for Elite. Okay, Elite to me is an eight-bit game. Okay, so if you're playing on a sixteen-bit machine, you've got a bit of an advantage because you've got a way more superior. Um, hardware capability than the old 8-bit machines um, and um, my, my in my total purist head Elite is an 8-bit thing so if you're not playing it on an 8-bit platform to me you're not really playing a proper Elite <laughs> so I personally and yeah you can disagree with me entirely I would personally um, discount from the competition the Atari uh, the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, and the Archimedes from being definitive versions of Elite. Okay, um, probably, and having played the uh, eighty-eight bit versions, you know, the only ones I've played, I've played the C sixty-four, I've played the BBC, and I've played the Spectrum, and I think, on balance, the BBC version is more fun in combat. Okay, it's because the frame rate is higher and all that sort of stuff. I think the Spectrum version that we've been playing, we've been watching is particularly good on some of the immersion side and the missions okay um so um and there are there are other ports now if you so i would i would say in the 8-bit land i would probably put the bbc first disc version first simply because it's the original and the combat is really really good and it's quite exciting the sound is better but i would give the spectrum a very very worthy second place because of the missions and the you know all that sort of stuff in there. I think the Spectrum version is actually very, very good. Um, I'd put the C64 version third because it suffered from a really, really poor frame rate um, because of its hardware limitations. But it does have the trouble mission, so we'll maybe get a few extra points. So that's how I would do it: BBC disc version first. Um, there are other 8-bit versions like the Electron version. Um, that's really slow and doesn't have a lot of the features, so that kind of is out. Um, um, and I don't know how many other 8-bit, I mean the Amstrad 8-bit version was there as well, but that's not as advanced as the Spectrum version, so that falls down a little bit. So, and then there's a BBC tape version, which is like the disc version, but with less features, so again that drops down the list. Um, so the BBC B disc version and the ZX Spectrum version, I think, are the best versions of Elite. Okay, now if you widen it to include the 16-bit versions, then I would probably give my vote to the Archimedes. And the Archimedes had the advantage that it was written in such a way that the NPC ships could react and do their own thing. Okay, so in and, and as far as I'm aware, in every other version of Elite, um, it's totally player-centric, okay? The other ships do not interact with each other. Whereas in the Archimedes version of Elite, ships could in, they could interact with the other so one thing you you will never see in 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 these versions of elite is any ships fighting each other other than you okay they will only fight you they will never fight each other okay their ships are totally unaware because of the way they're programmed of anything else okay they are only concerned with you and so you will never see in a spectrum or bbc version um 
you um, they never fight each other okay they're just not aware of each other at all they're only aware of you the player um, so um, but in the Archimedes version that's not true they do do their own thing and so you'll see fleets of ships flying around doing missions for themselves and if you want to get involved you can and if you don't then don't you know, but they will attack each other and do things which is quite cool um, so um, that's that's my understanding of it anyway um, I don't believe unless somebody tells me otherwise that the Atari ST versions and the um, Commodore Amiga versions had that capability. I think they're more straightforward ports of it. What the Commodore and Atari ST did provide is filled in better graphics so they looked solid, obviously better sound, possibly better missions. I don't know. Um, so, um, you know, those sort of things. Now, um, um, Commander Ariok does talk about. Um, oh, yes, I should have saved. Yeah, let's just do that. I can save in space, which is something I can't do on the other versions. Um, uh, I need to keep jumping. Let's keep jumping. Just keep jumping. Um, so yeah, so there are versions, of, uh, you know, subsequent kind of unofficial versions of Elite for the Spectrum, Elite Two and Elite Three, and we might have a quick look at those after we've done this, um, just to see what the differences are. Um, that do make, you know, ships hyperspace out and do attack each other and all sorts of other bits and pieces like that. So. Um, the elite versions were extended unofficially by um, other, other other people, so um, you know to do those sort of things. But the I believe the Archimedes version is the only one that officially did that, and I think uh, it was also ported to the PC. So early PCs um, had a copy of Elite. Um, there were two versions, of like a CGA one and a, a later VGA one. Um, so that that was a thing. Um, so, so yeah, so those those are the sort of things that were going on. Um, um, oh, and there's the tube processor, co-processor version for the BBC. So there's lots of variants, and tracking those all down would be really hard work. And I think Ian Bell's website is probably <laughs> the most definitive source of that information at the moment. Um, um, and unlikely to be better. I haven't time to do that sort of research. I have to say. Um, right. So we're back here. Let's let's just let's just keep doing what we've been doing. So yes, it might be fun to go and dig up one of those and see what it's like, um, just for a bit of fun. So if I can get this mission to trigger today, then we'll obviously we'll do that. But, um, but yeah, we'll we'll do that because I think we hopefully with the with this mission we will have effectively played out the spectrum version of the game. Um, but I was just looking back on how long we've been playing this to do this, and we've, you know, we've not really been hanging around. We've been shooting things, flying around. I know I've been chatting and stuff like that, but we've, we've been playing the game, and we have been playing the game for uh, well, probably. I think I've counted up. It's ver it, we're we're pretty much at the twenty-four hour mark at this point in terms of the amount of time I've been playing Elite on the Spectrum to get this far and trigger all the missions, and that's with some knowledge of what I'm doing. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, so that shows how playable and long term this game is, you know. If you know, and we've had the advantages that we're playing on an emulator, um, you know, which means I've got instant save and instant reload and all that sort of stuff. So I haven't got all the hassle that the original Spectrum version had of loading from cassette and saving my position and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you know, so. If you add those sort of things in, we were talking about hours and hours and hours of gameplay. So it's you know it's pretty impressive still, I think, as a as a product. Sounds almost like where the modern age would run, but it can't run Doom. <laughs> um, well, to be honest, the mark of a successful eight-bit computer was really does it does it have the main game titles of the time? You know, it's still the same argument that we have with things like the PlayStation and the. Um, you know, the other things is that the, you know the, the main big games are they available on the platform and Elite was certainly one of those things it was a bit like the early PCs with can it run flight simulator you know um, if your computer didn't have a port of Elite on it it really wasn't worth a mention so there were and there were computers at the time that didn't and they rapidly disappeared after this era so I'm thinking of things like the Dragon 32 and the Dragon 64 pretty sure that didn't have a version of Elite for it um, and uh, the Oric 
um, there was an Oric computer, which I think was hardware-wise quite similar to the Spectrum, but superior again. Um, it had a better sound chip, and I think it used fourth as its programming language rather than basic. Um, so it was much faster in its execution of even native code. Um, but you know, no version of Elite. <laughs> so you know, it it kind of crashed and burned and died. Um, not enough software, and even today. You know, the platform with the software is the one that wins. Um, doesn't have to necessarily be the um, you know, the best platform. So again, against the background of all of that stuff, the ZX Spectrum's hardware capabilities are pretty pretty thin and ropey compared to um, computers that came after it. But um, the Spectrum survived being manufactured into the 90s in various different forms. You know, that's not bad for a computer, okay? You know, ten year run it had. Um, was the Oric six five zero two? It was basic. I thought it was. Which one was the one I'm thinking of then? So Oric was basic. I'm thinking of another one then. Um, there was one. I'm sure there was a computer that used Fourth as its native language. Somebody will find out about it. Oric was six five zero two. Uh, oh, the Ace Jupiter Ace. That was it. Jupiter Ace. That was right. Oh, that's one of these imaginary anacondas again, which I've just killed. <laughs> oh, um. Um, it's all kills. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of computers around that sort of time that literally just died a death fairly quickly in the early 80s because of that problem of not having the software support. And, you know, you didn't want to, you know, parents quickly caught on for their kids wanting to know which computer was good. And if basically, if you didn't have a whole library of games available for it, it was a rubbish computer, no, regardless of the, um, that's one of those Ferdinand's bounty hunters, regardless of the, um, <laughs> I can know what it um, um, Oh, the Spectrum had lightning. Yes, I do remember that. Um, poor Oric. <laughs> A Jupiter Ace had four. So it was the Jupiter Ace. There we go. Um, poor Oric. I had an Oric 1 and an Atmos from my dad. And I think we had two games. <laughs> Mines of Mario and all kinds of And that was the thing. You know, you, could, you just didn't have a, a software a library. Then, you know, your computer was dead in the water. Because, no, you know, once it started not having any software available for it, nobody would develop for it because there wasn't a market. So the, with, the computers that won were the computers that were there early and built the software library. Um, and the ZX Spectrum beat really certainly in the uk beat the beat this commodore 64 and the bbc because um most of the uk developers wrote for the spectrum um uh, in terms of the games so uh so there you go yes so um um reverse polish notation and stuff um <laughs> uh, all good stuff um Fourth was amazing, yes, there was that. Uh, if you ever missed a, um, there's a Jupiter Ace call for it, a TI-99, TRS-80. Um, yeah, so I don't think the early Atari 8-bit machines, I remember them as well. Um, was it the 800, 400XL and the 800XL, something like that. Um, I don't think they had Elite 4. I remember my a friend of mine at school, because we were all talking Elite, okay? We were all talking Elite. And I do remember him getting a bit miffed with us because I think he had an Atari 800XL. And um, he was playing a game called Alternate Reality, um, which I must admit I've not looked at since. But um, I, I, and I'm pretty sure Elite never came out on the Atari 8-bit machines either. Um, and, and, and Elite was mostly European, that's, that is fair to say. Um, but I think he was really miffed with us. <laughs> I think he's didn't talk to us for several months while we went through our elite thing because he couldn't play elite because he didn't have it on his platform. Um, uh, Star Raiders was there elite, so I don't know. I haven't seen that one. Um, but it wasn't elite, okay, because <laughs> elite was elite. Um, all right, so let's just, just keep jumping here. We haven't got this mission to trigger yet. Um, I don't know how many jumps we're, we're away from it. We, we must be getting close now. Um, Let's just keep jumping. So, um, Star Raiders on, the, you know, they were great fun. And when you're tired of running calls, you can write your own. Well, yeah, so I must, I, uh, Lightning, I do remember that. Um, I think I actually had it. I don't think I ever 
kind of actually <laughs> ever learned how to use it. It's one of those things I thought. Um, uh, I think I may still have it somewhere in a box. I don't think I've ever used it. <laughs> um, as I recall, it didn't have any sound. You couldn't do any sound with it. So um, um, on the Spectrum version, anyway. So I'm not sure how useful it really was. I don't. I mean, it was supposed to be a sort of game development environment, from what I recall. But whether or not anybody actually used it to write the games, I don't know. Um, but I do remember it. Yeah, I do remember it. And could it could it convert things directly into assembler or something for speed? Um, I don't know. It sounds like it might be a compiler thing too, but um, uh, maybe somebody can say. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know enough about that. I do vaguely remember it. Um, so uh, yes, the Apple Two. Uh, Apple Two did have a leak. Yes, um, and the P early PCs had a leak as well. So. Um, yeah, the work port's done. Fourth is a middle level language. Okay, so it's probably more performant than basic. Because basic on the spectrum was horrendously slow. It really wasn't any good for speed. It was good for learning, um, but it was awful for uh, awful performance on the spectrum. Right, so we're still, <laughs> still jumping about. Um, right, we're in our fuel again. Let's head for. There we are, let's head for the planet, do our thing. Um, so, okay, Kelvin, uh, that's the only one. Okay, so it's about the only American machine that got the that got a copy of Elite was the Apple II. Okay, apart from the C64, which is kind of an American machine, isn't it? Um, yeah, apart from the C64. Yeah, interesting that. Because, I mean, there's a lot of, um, and yeah, I suppose the IBM PC, because um, by that point, I think the PC had, it wasn't just the IBM PC, the, it, it had been decloned, didn't it? So I think IBM licensed the PC design so other manufacturers could make it, um, and so on and so forth. Here's another ASP. You can tell by the way it attacks what ship it is. So what hit them? Wondering what's going on. <laughs> um, I like the clicking device. <laughs> yes, the E looks massive, doesn't it? Um, so does the S when the station appears. Um, there's another Cobra just flying around. Um, Compaq, yeah. So they, they they did some of the clones. Didn't they? I mean, PC PC history is another whole. Mess, mess of things, isn't it, with the 8086 architecture? <laughs> Go on like that for hours as well. Um, and um, yeah, because the first PC I ever used was an XT model, the early XT with the 8086. That was a technically well, I think the 8086 is a 16 bit chip, isn't it? Um, but it's got some sort of 8 bitty limitations to it. It's a very old architecture. Um, and then my second PC, I remember being a, an 8386, and I was like, Whoa proper power that was it was 16 megahertz and everything yeah <laughs> and it was a proper dx version not that not the gp sx version which had i can't remember what the difference was but um there was you know early on in that architecture there was there were sx and dx versions and the dx ones are the ones to have um for reasons which i can't remember now somebody will somebody will know <laughs> and then it was so it was 8086 286 386 486 which was nice and easy to follow. Oh, and turbo buttons, yes, you had turbo buttons. So uh, everything in the 80s was a turbo to make it look cool. The cars had turbos on them. Um, and, and then the computers did as well. Um, 
which is really funny. But the turbo button was supposed to be switched on um, most of the time. And you had to switch it off to regain compatibility with some of the older software that couldn't run at high speed. Um, so it was sort of, and, uh, you know, it, it really wasn't a turbo in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, <laughs> it was just a speed switch, so you could run it in high speed for modern software, and you could run it in the original speed for, for older software that needed the timing to be great. But of course, the, the marketeers got hold of this. Um, so it was a speed switch, so we're going to call it Turbo. Because <laughs> it was the 80s, okay? So it wasn't just, you know, increase the speed of your computer, it was Turbo button. And it would normally come with a little LED, so you knew it was switched on, so Turbo mode engaged. <laughs> it's just uh, I hear, so this is why I love things like this in the eighties because <laughs> you know if you look at if you look at car ad you know, car adverts from the eighties you know the turbo charging as a thing I mean it, it originated before the eighties obviously but turbo charging as a thing became quite widespread in the in the eighties um, to the, to the fact that you know if your if your car was a turbo charged car. Um, everybody would know because there would be massive letters down the side of your car that said turbo <laughs> and um, it would be on the back of the car as well you know in big letters you know, but 1.8 turbo you know? <laughs> you'd be no doubt as to whether or not the car had a turbo on it okay um, this was from an era where you know you'd have badges on the back of your car that would tell everybody else what level I mean we've talked about this before I think but but what what pecking order you were okay so if you just had a an L or a C then you were kind of down the bottom end you know if you had a uh, a GL then you were you know you you know you had decent carpets and stuff like that um, um, and then if you had a GLI then you obviously had fuel injection um, but the I really only in the 80s the I didn't really stand for fuel injection it it stood for I'm better than you <laughs> <laughs> so before long, of course, everybody everybody wanted an I on the back of the car, hence the GTIs and the SLIs and the SRIs at the time and all that sort of stuff. And then, of course, turbos came along. So everybody had a turbo badge, you know. And it wasn't uncommon for kids of my age, and I, I was probably guilty of this myself at somewhere along the line, uh, going to Halfords and buying stick-on turbo badges to stick on the back of their the one-litre Fiestas and things like that. Um, to try and make them look faster than they were. Um, so at one point it was all about red stripes on the side of your car, go faster stripes. And on the other, and at the other times it was basically, um, have you got a turbo badge or a 16 valve badge or whatever it happened to be. And it all calmed down a bit in the 90s and it, all that sort of stuff, stuff faded away. But of course in the 80s, a turbo on a car was a big exciting thing. So of course your computer had to have a turbo button. Um, and if you look at, it was things like, if you look at um, some of the um, TV of the time, I mean, I'm thinking of Night Rider here, okay. Um, that, you know, when you, when you would boost over things, the car could jump over obstacles, okay. And it, but in order to do that, it would, it was a turbo button that did it. So you'd hit the turbo button um, and the car would jump over obstacles. <laughs> Which, of course, isn't how a turbo works. But <laughs> it looked cool for TV. So you'd be you'd be driving. Yeah, you know, Michael Knight with with Knight Rider would be driving Kit, which is this semi intelligent car. If he needs to jump something, he's like puts his foot down, presses his turbo button, <laughs> the car leaps forward, and you see him in the driver's seat do the kind of. <laughs> it's like a nitrous injection, really. Um, which of course this isn't how a turbo works at all, but. <laughs> It just looked good for TV, and of course we were all impressionable teenagers at this time, um, and we just that's you know turbo button, <laughs> whoosh, <laughs> and so of course as parents started cottoning on to having a turbo car, yeah, you know, it was a, it was a good time. Um, a, a really really bad unbalanced turbo might make you leap in the air. Yes, I suppose that's true. Um, so. <laughs> but computers had turbos, cars had turbos, and if you look. Ah, um, oh, Wintermute's just beaten me to it. Um, he's just stolen my thunder, that's, which is fine. <laughs> but yeah, if you look in the original Battlestar Galactica, they have a they have a joystick in the Vipers, okay, and there are three buttons. One of which is fire, which I think is the central one. There's another one on the right, I think, or was it left? That just said I M, and I don't know what that does. Okay, I never saw them press it in the in the in the in the TV series. But of course, on the right is Turbo. <laughs> 
<laughs> so of course in Battlestar Galactica, you know, they would be firing away, zap, 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 shooting the Cylons. And then to to boost, they had they kind of had boost like um, Elite does. You know, <laughs> press the turbo button, and the ship would lots of jets would come out the back like an afterburner. <laughs> And off the Viper would go. But of course, you couldn't keep the turbo on all the time because presumably the ship would overheat or something. So it was like a limited boost, but you did have turbo in space. <laughs> so everything was turbo in the 80s because that was cool. Uh, if you had a turbo, you know, you were better than people who didn't have a turbo. So spaceships, computers, cars, everything had a turbo if it was any good. Ah, uh, good day. So does anybody know? I mean, can anybody remember that? on Battlestar Galactica with the joystick. There was a fire button, there was a turbo button, and there was another button called IM. And I don't know what it did. Did we ever see what what that button did? I wondered if it was reverse thrusters or something, maybe inverse mode. Maybe it was like a retro thruster thing. Um, <laughs> naturally aspirated spaceships, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, and I, I must admit, I have been influenced because some of you who know me on have been following me on Twitter know that I've got a little MX-5 which has a supercharger on it, which is different to a turbocharger. You know, the technicality don't matter, but um, the supercharger on my MX-5, I can directly link back to watching Mad Max 2 as a kid, okay? <laughs> so the reason I have a supercharged MX-5 today is because there was a supercharger on the Mad Max interceptor car in that film. <laughs> Because, as you know, I'm a big kid at heart. <laughs> and that's why I've got a supercharged car. Not because it's, you know, I just wanted to have a supercharged car. <laughs> because supercharger, you know. <laughs> um, and in the film, um, in, in the film Mad Max 2, you'll notice that the supercharger doesn't work properly. <laughs> because it can be switched on and off by a button in the car. Um, and um, what it, the way it appears to work in Mad Max 2 is that most of the time he can drive around without the supercharger switched on. It's sort of sitting on the bonnet of the car with a big belt around it. Um, you know, completely wrong because that's exposed to gravel and all sorts of stuff, which you wouldn't want um, in any sensible car. Um, and most of the time it seems to not be running. Okay, it's, it's, you know, and then basically if he needs extra power from his car, which of course he does to get away from baddies and stuff, um, he can pull a lever in his car and somehow the supercharger engages, spins up and goes, <laughs> starts sucking air in. <laughs> and then the car gets a boost of power, which is kind of how a supercharger works. But unfortunately, a supercharger needs to be constantly running all the time. Oh, 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 oh. Did you see that? Did you see that? There was a message on the screen, which is now gone. <laughs> I didn't catch it. What did that say? Uh, Mayday, rave invade, we have the mission. Yes, we are here, my friends. We have half an hour to go. Can we do this? Right, rave has been <laughs> rave invaded. <laughs> um, woo, mission triggered. Da, 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 da. Okay, so this, right, it's saying rave. Where's that? Um, let's go back to, right, first things first, let's save. Let's do a quick save as. So we think. Uh, Want to do a save as actually here, right? So, Thargoid invasion, okay? Dun, dun, dun. Right, so we have the, we have the mission. So, let's what does it say? Let's just get this again. Um, rave invaded R A R I A V E. So let's have a look at the galaxy map, see if we can find out where that is. How do I f search? There we go. Uh, re a b. Where is it? Okay, so it's over there, 28 light years away, has been invaded. So that um, is there. So presumably, we need to actually travel to the space station, a space station, to find out what's going on. So, um, or do we, <laughs> or do we have to just go to rave? I think I need to dock now. So let's see if we can find somewhere safe to dock. Um, rather than these anarchy systems that we've been bouncing about in. Let's see if we can find it. There's a corporate state, perfect. Let's go there because that's gonna be safer. We're gonna to go to a rave. <laughs> um, awesome, so we have the, this is good, we have the final mission. Da, da, da. Right, okay, so 
let's let's dock here. Uh, get the mouse off the screen because we're capturing this, aren't we? Why did it have to be rave? <laughs> rave invaded by teenagers and hippies. <laughs> Best stock with plenty of guns and missiles. Okay, so um, we are we're fully loaded as far as I'm aware um, with everything that we could possibly want. Um, it's a hippier version of Lave, <laughs> the Rave system. Presumably, <laughs> um, it just randomly chooses that, uh, which which is quite good. Um, <laughs> yeah, inst, 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 inst. <laughs> um, oh, come on! Stop giving me spawning ships. I want to get to the planet. Stupid anaconda, whatever it is. Pick up your. Oh, no, it's cargo. We'll have that. Right, so let's get to. Let's get to the dock as fast as we can. Come on. Um, mass lock. Dun, 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 dun. Oh my gosh, is it? <laughs> Make sure I take water. I hear flashing ease dehydrate. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> song. Actually, um, raves are a bit. Are they? Are they I don't remember raves. Were raves in the eighties or was that a nineties thing? I can't remember now. I've got a feeling they started in the late eighties. Um, I remember people talking about ease and things and um, raves in sort of parties in the middle of nowhere and all that sort of stuff. Um, late eighties. It was late eighties. Yeah, I thought it was late eighties. I do because I was just going off to university as it started happening. Um, come on, why is it still mass locked? Uh, it's still there, but whatever that ship is, it's taking ages to get out of range. Come on, you're stopping the mission. So it's interesting enough, it's given me a warning there a few times. Made a, a war, was it warning rave invaded? Um, and it stopped telling me that now. Come on, get out of range. Oh. Come on, the game is just annoying. Yeah, um, that's right, it was warehouses, that's right. Mayday is definitely a call for help, isn't it? Um, now we've got pirate, in a corporate system. So what is that all about? <sighs> oh, I'll tell you something that happened the other day while I was just doing some jumps um, around is I had did have an encounter with a Thargoid in normal space, which I have only seen that once. It hasn't happened again since. Um, so that is um, that is unusual, but it did happen. So I encountered a Thargoid in open space. Um, um, which which was unusual. Um, I don't do anything particularly wrong. Right, so let's dock. That's working right. So hopefully we now find out a little bit more about the mission. Okay, right, ooh, there we go. All pink. <laughs> uh, right, wanted by Galcop, a brave commander for a special mission. Are you interested? <laughs> what's, the, what's the mission? Um, right, I think this is a good this is a good point to save. Um, <laughs> wanted by Galcop. Pink, a pink mission. Yes, I'm interested. Am I really? <laughs> what happens if I say no? Well, we can nah, nah, put the kettle on. <laughs> Am I interested? Nah. Well, this is this is the thing. What's quite nice about exploring these missions is we try and find any holes in them. We did this with the um, we did this with the um, supernova mission, trying to find a way around it, didn't we? And, and explore some of the possibilities which we can do. Um, okay, so we'll obviously for the moment we'll say yes because I want to capture this mission. Okay, so the Thargons, oh, hello. Not the Thargoids, interesting enough. The Thargons are using the space station at Rave to attack the planet. Your mission is to destroy the space station. So this is this is quite cool, okay? So this is the first time that you're allowed to attack and destroy a space station. They're normally invulnerable. Um, but it should be the Thargoids. Why is it the Thargons? Typo? Um, or just weren't paying attention? <laughs> The Thargons are using the space station at Rave to attack the planet. Your mission is to destroy the space station at Rave. Okay, well that's, and that's it. Okay, so that's that's what we've got to do. We've got to get across to the Rave system. So let's 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 head there. Um, we'll just fuel up and go. 
because we've got to get to rave. Now we don't have a root plotter um, in in Elite. We just got to do it manually. <laughs> so we're just going to have to find our way across. That's a lovely go. So let's get there. So um, so we don't know. I haven't this now. This mission um, is the only one of the original set on the spectrum that I have never actually played. So this is. Um, this is um, this is entirely new ground for me. I have not played this. I do not know what's coming up. Uh, so this is going to be quite interesting. Um, so yeah, so I am I am clueless in this regard. I have not done this mission. So this is this is for me a bit of a treat, okay? Uh, because you know I played this game for for years as a kid, uh, but I never got this far. <coughs> I did do the supernova mission, I did do the Spiasp mission, but I never triggered this for whatever reason, either because I didn't know what the mission triggers were, so just didn't jump around enough, or just kept resetting my save, or what, for whatever reason, I never did this mission. Um, so it's gonna be, oh, now it's playing silly buggers with me and not letting me dock. Oh, I hate it when it does this. I'm gonna have to go to the sun to refuel. Oh, we've got half an hour. We should be right. Um, it's good. <laughs> there is a root plot. It's called me. So have we been given? Have we been given? We don't. Oh, look, we do. Look, there we go. ECM system jammer. We've been given the equipment. It didn't tell us we were given the equipment, but it's given us the equipment anyway. Um, which which is which is cool. So it hasn't explained that though. Um, I've got a ship behind me, I have, haven't I? So I'm going to have to go back to the star. Um, that would explain it. The message sounded awkward. <laughs> Saves a bite. Yes, well, that's a good point. Yes, that's that's a good point. Um, does the, that mean the space station has to be hit with a missile? Uh, I don't know. It hasn't told me how to destroy the space station. Um, so is that is that missiles or is it will it succumb to a laser attack? I don't know. And what's going to be in the system when we get there? Presumably it's going to be swarming with thargoids. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. Asp. First, I've got to refuel. So I'm going to get through this part of the game as fast as I can because. We need to refuel. <coughs> oh, oh, I mean pirates, of course. So the game is just toying with me now, <laughs> but it's not too far away, fortunately. Um, Took you a few tries, okay. So you have to figure it out, okay. So that's good. So the jammer should be the I key. No, the I key is the long range chart, so that's not right. Uh, maybe it's automatic, you have to figure it out. Yeah, so don't give me any spoilers at this point. That's that's cool. Oh, come on, really? <laughs> I just want to get to the star. Come on, oh, right, energy bomb, I think. I'd like that. Good night. <laughs> I can always buy another one of those. Yay, look, we got some. Oh, really? That's just that's just unfair, that is. I if I can get to the star without getting some of those in range. Let's put the cloaking device on for a bit. I think they're going to be too close, but... Just, just mean. Uh, yeah, elite mean mode, isn't it? It is. If I can get some of them out of range, there we go. They're almost out of range now. 
ships, all four ships are there. They're going to come back on stream now, but they won't be in range. So with a bit of luck, the fuel scoops will start scooping. There we go. Right, now I've got to be a bit careful of the... Where's the, where's the sun gone? <laughs> I'm a bit close to the star now. So I better turn around and head back the other way. There is one ship that's still spawned there. Uh, but the thing is recharging, so I can switch that back on. There we go. And be invincible for a bit. I just need enough to be able to jump out. Let's go to the rear, which is... Oh, that's an anarchy. Nice. I don't really want to go there. Let's go to there. Anarchy is just going to be impossible to get out of. So we've got enough fuel to get there, so let's just go. Excellent. <laughs> Hostile ship may be sent against you, yeah. Right, let's let's save there let's go, just in case something goes wrong, which it probably will because it's elite. Um, let's see if we can get to the planet. Why is the, oh, the cloaking device was still training power though, it even wasn't switched on there. Uh, let's let that recharge a moment. See if we can get to the space station. How far away are we from the rave system? It's up here somewhere, isn't it? Is it that one? Which one was it? There, that's where we've got to get to. Um, yeah, I don't want hyperspace, right? Pirates, bloody pirates! The only problem with this game is they want to get somewhere. <laughs> it slows you down. And we've only got a seven light year jump range, of course, because that's the original game. Quite a long way out from the planet still, but there we go. Right, so uh, Ike was the um, I jumped while cloaked. Ah, I did, didn't I? Uh, sorry, the Ike was the Amiga version. Okay, the closer you get, you should be able to hear the music. <laughs> Don't think we're going to get anything like that on the spectrum. But yeah, we should get some dun 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 dun, dun music, shouldn't we? Um, Okay, the IM button on the Viper stick stands for inverse mode. Okay, well, there we go. Possible J key. No, no the J is jump. J is, um, J is the tourist drive on the spectrum, so it's not that. Um, this is the ZX version. You can't hear the music. <laughs> yeah, unst, 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 unst. Um, yeah, so a sound is a sound is a definite, but I mean the spectrum was bad at the time. Okay, just so try L. Okay, what's L? L is no, that's my status display, so it's not that. Um, does the UCM is the UCM jammer automatic? Maybe does it does it need to be switched on? Oh come on, stop giving me such a hard time with the baddies. I want to get over there. <laughs> Slow me down, you beta. This will be crates and sidewinders, of course. Sidewinder. Die. Right. Virtually impossible to hit the dots. Which is a bit annoying. That's another sidewinder. I wonder again of a crate. Usually it'll be a crate. Yeah, it is. Okay. And we'll have that as payment for the inconvenience. Slaves. Great. <laughs> right, there's the space station. There's the S. And it's not letting me talk. Ah! I hate this computer sometimes. Fugitive, I'm only an offender, so I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not that bad. This is so annoying because that means I've got to fly back to the star, which is miles away. I can't go anywhere else. No, oh, so annoying. And I've got to fight my way back through pirates to get to the star. So maybe I should just go for the stars each time. I need an escape pod. Um, device. 
So yeah, this is a, it's just delaying tactics on behalf of the computer, really. Nobody expects that. waste time going back to the start to refuel again. Maybe I'll just go for storage time at least it guarantees we'll get there. Boom, gotcha. It's not letting us dock, which is just mean. I don't know why, sometimes the spectrum motion just doesn't let you dock for no obviously good reason, um, which is a bit frustrating. That'll probably be an S or a Cobra. Dun, 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 dun. So this is, the, you know, the game has got <laughs> tiny bit predictable at this point. This is an S. Um, good night. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, actually that was quite a nice run through there. Good, right, so let's get that in there and then we'll sit here refueling and jump to where we're going to go next. Right, fuel scoops are on, excellent. Right, so where are we going to go? Uh, right, we need to get how far away? That's 7.6 light years, we can't go that far. Oh, that's a bit annoying, 8.8. .8. So we've actually, which way do we want to go? Doesn't really make any difference, okay, so which is a nice system. That's the democracy, good. Okay, let's go there. That's slightly further than that one, which is an anarchy, so we're definitely not going there. Uh, right, we'll go to the Soizer's, Soizer system, uh, whilst we have the fuel. Um, what's the tech this? Okay, let's have a look at what's going on there. So yeah, that's a good point. So this is where we've got to get to. It is, oh look, here we are. It's a communist tech level nine. And there, I haven't seen that either. Look, Rave is resisting a Thargon invasion. So it's Thargons again. <laughs> They've saved a few bytes of information there. Um, interesting, yeah, interesting how extra little bits have been added in there to give a little bit of flavour to the mission. Um, is it the case of the game not t letting you dock or the docking computer fail? I don't know. I mean, the docking computers are there, but I don't know what would happen if I tried to dock. I suspect it would crash and die. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good. That's a very good question. Um, but I think if the docking computer doesn't work on the Spectrum version, it means for whatever reason that the space station has closed its gates. <laughs> um, not enough fuel yet. Almost there. Can't be far now. Yes, it's probably an error. I suspect you're right. I suspect Thargon is an error on the part of Taurus. I think you're probably right. So, um, oh, come on. I mean, oh, that's why. <laughs> it didn't have the right system selected. Um, right, so let's go to the star. I will, I will save the game again so we don't lose any progress. Otherwise, that's going to be really dispiriting, isn't it? Um, Let's go, where do we want to go next? That's 7.2. Right, the, the planets here are really bad, awkwardly located. That's one's, okay, that's anarchy though. Regions of democracy, so we'll go there next. Okay, so that's, the star and the sun is equidistant, so it doesn't really matter. So let's go to the star, because it's guaranteed to be able to give us some fuel. Um, that will hopefully be a little bit quicker zapping in there nice and fast. That's good. Oh, what one pirate. Not too bad. Right, let's deal with you. And then we can see if we can attempt the Thargoid invasion. How much am I there now? Why is it I'm always down to my last 15 minutes? <laughs> it's a race against time. Shields. There we go. Might as well have that. Since we're 
close. Oh, the slaves again. Oh, don't spawn another ship, please. It's just mean. I need a, I'd like a boost button. <laughs> yeah, we're locked on Ray, ramming speed. Um, Eric, did you have to go to Rehave as well? No, I assume the planet location is random. I don't know, is it? Um, next week on Thargon Invasion. I think the planet selection is random, yeah, because you could be in another galaxy, yes. Uh, Ariok bot a different system, but about the same distance away. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, so you've got to travel to get to the um, thing. So when I, when I put the video of this mission up, I'm gonna have to edit this out a bit. <laughs> This is a boring stuff. Just trying to get there, um, so I will I will do a bit of that. Right. So okay, so that's a civilian ship. That's okay. Let's dive straight into the heart of the sun. Cabin temperatures coming up. Which is good. Fuel scoop should switch on at the moment. There we are, fuel scoops are on. All right, so then we just need to go to Rige, which is also a democracy. And then from there, we've just got, we'll probably have to go up to there, wherever that is. The may, oh, the Mabiat system. Do you remember the Mabiat system? Yep. <laughs> we've been there before. Uh, maybe we were, maybe we weren't. So then we can jump to Suvreri and then we can jump to Rio. So we've got three more jumps to do. That's not too bad. Fuel scoops are on. Are we in range yet? No. Come on. It takes quite a long time to fuel scoop, actually. <laughs> Neutron boost. Yeah. Camber temperature's creeping up. Yeah. So basically, when on the spectrum version, I don't know if it's the same on the other ones, but basically, when you get to fuel scoop range, then throttle down and sit there, um, and then you aren't in danger of crashing into the star before you refuel. Yeah. What we need is a fuel injection kelvinator from Olite. That would be really, really good. The fuel injectors. Um, which space fuel injectors are very, very cool. Um, but yeah, it's a shame we can't boost the hyperspace drive to go more than seven light years, but um, no option to do that, unfortunately. Uh, almost in range of reach. There we go. A little bit more. Come on, one more, one more, one more clip. There we go. Right, off we go. Right, we'll keep heading to the star. Set the controls for the heart of the sun. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, so let's save our progress again. Oh, we're quite close to the planet here, so let's go there, see if we can dock. Is it going to be nice to us? Oh, it's giving us a pyro, isn't it? Okay, so maybe not, but anyway, what's our rating now? Well, we're still in the fender, actually. There's the S. Yes, we were able to dock. Excellent. Even bad. Put a turbo badge. <laughs> That's what we need. A turbocharged Cobra. Right, let's buy lots of fuel. Um, Okay, let's save that. Let's get to the maybe at system. <laughs> I'm not doing that joke again. <laughs> I did that last week. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it was funny. <laughs> well, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Don't know about you guys, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> right, so if <laughs> we are in the maybe at system. Ah, uh, dear. It's all good. All right, what about the star? No sign of the star. Okay, docked. All right, pirates. Deal with the pirates. Oh, 10 minutes, come on. Don't want to do this next time. Well, maybe it, it depends if I'm able to defeat the mission, but Commander Ariok had to do it several times. Um, so I, the chances of me getting it right first time are pretty low, given I do not know what I'm going to be facing. So. Um, I'd like to at least have a stab at it on this stream, and maybe we maybe we'll have to complete it next stream. Depends how it goes. Um, I mean, there's a lot of ships there. Look, three of them all together. All right, so I think it's time to engage the cloaking device. Oh, no, engage the cloaking device. Uh, which one of those is closest? There we go. Let's take the sidewinders out when they can't see me, which is highly amusing. I'll probably get clean shots on there as one. I'll get the other one. Oh, come on. Right, and let's get the other one. There it 
is it's a crate he has no idea oh so the ship's just popped back into existence where the heck did that come from um <laughs> And I'll have the cargo's conversation. Right, okay, that's, that's those pirates dispatched. There we go, some radioactives. I don't know if they're worth anything. Head for the planet. Come on. Oh. What's this? Buy purple The mission will be completed maybe at the end of the stream. <laughs> Frank Miner has gone there. He's gone there. But in ludicrous speed, ludicrous speed, go to play. That's what we need. We need boost. We need power. We need we need more thrusters. Um, actually, a tiny little bit of lore about the the games and the in the the ships in the originally is that they were their speed rating was something called light Mac, which presumably is sort of just a, a bit of fun based on Mac as in um, speed of sound. Um, and, and the way you read it was that light Mac was sort of a percentage of the speed of light, which of course doesn't make any sense at all. But um, the Cobra had a speed of 0.3 light Mac. Um, the Sidewinder, as I recall, was 0.37. And the fastest ship in the game was the Asp at 0.4. Everything else was sort of varieties of that sort of stuff between. So your Cobra was pretty quick, but it wasn't the fastest ship. Um, stop giving me pirates. I think it's a bit of a multi-government system, so there are a few pirates about. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know what happened to Light Mac as a measurement. It seems to have disappeared. But that was how it was done on the original game. It's a asp. station. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Another bar. Dun, 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 dun. It's probably another asp. Yep, it's another asp. Stop shooting at my ship. charge a bit before we fly on. Um, Ultimate Hellbringer is here as well. A, a new name for your hat. The maybe hat. <laughs> ah, you guys are good. Um, Ultimate Hellbringer Halley, good to see you. We're, we're near the end of the stream. I, I'm desperately trying to get across the chart so I can do this, do this mission. Yes, it let me dock. <laughs> Ah, oh, goodness for that. Well, we're, we're, we're so close. I may have, I, I should be able to extend a little bit. Come on, right. Desperately trying to get there. Right, uh, where did we say we were going? The Soveri system, wasn't it? Which is a oh, feudal, great. Um, is anything, no, it's not really an alternative without doing an extra jump. So it's gonna have to be that system. Um, I will save it. And we'll have a look how close we are to the star when I get there to see what's the best way in. Buy an energy bomb. Oh, I should have bought an energy bomb. That was a very good point. Um, yes, that's probably, let me just do a quick load you. I'm very, that's a very good point. So I'm gonna cheat by quick loading. Buying an energy bomb, yes. Good call. Um. <laughs> that's one thing you can do with the emulator. <laughs> um, right, let's go to the Soveri. One jump out. We just need to refuel one more time. How close are we? Oh, miles away, of course, from the planet. How close are we to the star? So, so to guarantee that we refuel, I think I'm going to head for the star this time. If I can find the star, where is this? There it is. Um, the star looks closer than the planet, actually. So let's deal. Let's go to the star. That guarantees that we can refuel in case the 
space station is having a funny moment. Yeah. Where's the star? Where's the star? There it is. Right. Okay, another pirate, but so far so good. Feudal World is the second worst according to the book, but yeah, cheat mode enabled there, sorry. It was a bit of a cheat mode, but. Um. <laughs> it's not, it's kind of is cheat, isn't it? But it's not, it's just a time saver more than anything else. Very nice. That makes me defender again. Uh, don't know what that is. Probably an asteroid, but let's blast it out of the way anyway, because we're almost there. You can shoot the missiles down, it does make you feel like you're actually a really good pilot when that happens. Oh, look at that pirate right at the end. Right, we are literally almost there, my friends. Oh, we're right in fuel scoop zone. I'm gonna have to let him come to me. Um, so let's lock on target. There's the rave system. Really? While well, I'm refueling, that's just mean. They're not in range at the moment, so come on. Refuel, refuel, refuel. Um, you should have the option of ejecting um, cargo. Yeah. That'd uh, be great if you could use that cheat in the dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just need to. I'm going to put the. I'm going to put the. Cloaking device on while we refuel. I do not want to be shot to pieces here, but come on, we're so close. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I might as well cloak, yes. I think I will. Oh. No, I am cloaked. Alright, we're in range. Hyperspace. Turn the cloaking device off. I think I did. Right, we're in the system. We're in the system. Right, here we are. Right, so what have I got to do? Okay, so we're in the system. We have no fuel, so save the game. Okay, so the system map is telling us Rave is resisting a Thargoid invasion, which we think is Thargoid, but there we go. Okay. Um, right, so we presumably head for the planet, because that's where the space station is, I'm guessing. So let's, all right, okay, so we have an incoming ship. And that is a Thargoid. And it's now launching Thargons at me, which makes it a bit of a tough. Oh, no. Lost the ECM system already. Ouch. It's chucking all sorts of. Boom! Killed me straight away. <laughs> Okay, so this is quite tough. Good, good, we like tough. This is good, right, okay, so we died instantly there. Um, right, so quick load. Let's try, try that again. Um, right, okay, so I need to be a bit more cautious. 
Um, so we're going to get a Thargoid in place of the Pirates, I'm guessing. Um, here it comes again. Right, so this time we've got the cloaking device. So let's use that to get in range. Give ourselves a tactical advantage over this ship. It is a Thargoid again. It doesn't know we're here now. Um, Cloak, give it a chance. Right, then it starts launching Thargoids. Oh, well, if I can destroy it, yes, like that, then I get a, I get 50 credits for it, and the Thargons then stop responding, um, so they become dead in space. And there's another one. Picked up some alien items there, so I'm guessing that's another Thargoid coming to get me. So these guys are worth picking up because they are alien items, which I can then sell, assuming I survive. Right, so I'm going to fly away from that Thargoid for a moment because um, I'm almost in range of the space station there, interestingly enough. I want my shields to recharge a bit. So let's cloak, turn around. Deal with this guy. Yeah, it's another cargo. Okay, so that's cool. Um, so that's weak. Considerably. Got it. Right, okay. So decloak. Mm. That's right. So this would be a hard mission without the cloaking device. <laughs> This would be a very hard mission without the clicking device. Um, right, let's pick up that Thargon. Oh, that's just a piece of alloy. Never mind, never mind. Right, so we're not far off the space. Oh, no, another Thargon coming in. Okay, so it's spawning those for me to try and prevent me getting to the space station, which is just a little bit nasty. Right, there it is. Another Thargon. It's a cloak. <laughs> that. Right. Not really bothered about alloys. Let's see if we can get to the space station. Okay, so we're coming into range. Right, let's just let the shields recharge here. Okay, so another Thargoid has spawned. We'll get into visual range and then we will look. Because <laughs> those Thargons are actually really dangerous as they mount up. Not too bad to kill if you've got the cloaking device on. So, right, okay, so where's the space station? Mass locked. There's, there's the S, so it should be ahead of me. I can't see it. There it is again. There it are. Oh, I now have the space station in visual range. Right, this is the space station we are supposed to destroy. Quite how? Well, target missiles at it. Evil laugh and gaze. <laughs> or my muttly laugh. <laughs> try docking. I suppose I could. I don't want to muck it up though. This is the first. Well, we'll go back and try all the exploits next time, okay? I want to actually just, just try and do the mission. <laughs> Use your docking computer and walk in with the missiles under your arm. <laughs> right, so what's going to happen as we approach? Is it gonna is it gonna spawn Thargoids at us? This this station is fully operational. <laughs> okay, so I've got nothing no 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 alarm at the moment. So I've had Thargoids on the way in trying to stop me. That's still saying we're resisting a Thargon invasion. Um, stay on target. <laughs> I'm trying to use the force here, guys. Stop stop making me laugh. <laughs> right, space station. Is coming into range and the ECM will presumably stop so the ECM jam is a clue okay because that basically because normally if you fire a missile at a space station um, it'll instantly ECM it and so the ECM jammer must be allowing your missiles to reach the space station so I'm presuming I can't kill it so let's let's I'm gonna do another save here now that the stations in range um, 
Um, no, right, this is launching something. Okay, so there is a ship, the two ships launching. Okay, they both look like Thargoid vessels to me. I'm going to engage the cloak. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Frame rate. Fun. Overheated my gun. One down. Alright. Let's take that off. Space station. Are those Thargons or Tharg? Oh, they're Thargoids, blimey. It's really chucking everything at, it, at me to try and kill me. Oh, they're not hitting me yet. Well, oh, there's another one. Jeez. I think I'm going to take a run at the space station. Cloaking device on. Target. I have target lock. Sorry, <laughs> <Our> missile. <laughs> missile jammed. Oh. All right. Here we go. Does is the missile enough to do it? Yes. Apparently, it is. <laughs> right on, commander. <laughs> the only problem is I've now got like a whole stack of really angry thargoids on my tail. Um, so, and I haven't got any fuel to get out, so there's no space station because I just blew it up. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, right, well, we stand and fight. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get away with this. So this isn't any good because um, I can't escape. And I don't even know what. Yeah, I'm, I'm dead here. There's no way I'm going to survive this. That was a far goy. Okay, <laughs> so I know what to do. <laughs> um, the way to win that is probably to refuel at the star. I know I tried to use the but it runs out of energy. Um, I, I'm gonna have to try some alternatives. <laughs> um, low energy, yeah. Another case of going for the target. Get out of there, yeah. So I think that's a, that's a tactic. That's a way to win that. Um, so, um, anyway, we had a good go at it. Now, I'm, I'm actually out of time, I'm afraid. I'm really sorry about this. So, next week, we will do a full a full attack on, okay? And we'll do this properly, because I'm, 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 I'm rushed a bit. Um, so, um, let's, do, let's do that. Now we've got the mission trigger, I will, I will we'll, we'll take a bit more time to do it. At least we saw the mission today. That was really, really cool. Um, so I kind of succeeded, kind of failed there. I didn't get it. I, I, I destroyed the station, but didn't get away with it. So I want to do. I want to take a bit more time out about next week. So um, <laughs> we will do a little bit more of that next week. Um, so, uh, but anyway, there we go. Fantastic. I've got to. I've got to. Yeah. In terms of in terms of what. <laughs> In terms of what to, yeah, it's a good cliffhanger, isn't it? Come back next week and find out whether Drew succeeds against the Thargoids. Uh, so that was a bit of a suicide mission. <laughs> Do a manic laughter. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, enough of that. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, so next week we'll come back and do the Thargoid invasion properly and see if we can survive. And then we'll play around with the, um, you know, we'll play around with exploiting the game a little bit as a result. And see if we can find a way around it, because it was quite cool. So Thargoid's on the way in, and Thargoid's being launched from the space station as well. So, um, and ref yeah, we, we need to refuse, oh, excuse me, we need to refuse the mission as well to see if anything happens. So all those things need to be, all those things need to be checked. So next week, Thargoid Invasion. We are there. We have triggered the final mission on the spectrum. This is very, very cool. So anyway, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your company. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, more Thargoid Invasion next week. And we will, we will complete that. It means also we can complete our ZX Spectrum playthrough. So that will be the last ZX Spectrum Elite playthrough. And we'll go and do something else after that. <laughs> So that'll be awesome. Anyway, thank you very much, my friends. You take absolute care of yourself. Back on Monday for my creative stream. Back on Thursday for more Elite Dangerous and Formidine Rift. And I will see you then. Be good, and I'll see you anon.